Most of you today anyway. So. <laughs> oh, it's sunny in Manchester again. Exactly. It's always sunny in the north, isn't it? I used to, um, I, I now live in New Zealand and I've lived in New Zealand for about 12, 13 years. And the last job I had was in Manchester. Um, I was working for Granada and I wrote and um, produced and directed a, a pilot for a series that ran on Sky One called Crash Test Dummies. But I had a flat um, near, next to Manchester City Stadium. So I like Manchester, it's a great place. There we go, there we go. Right, so we're here to talk about, specifically about the character of Turbo. Um, how it came about in your first three episodes, so uh, I think it would be a great place to start if you talk about the casting process and how that came about. Yeah, um, how do actors get jobs? <laughs> um, luck is the, is the main word you, you, you need to remember. Okay, so um, I was in a soap opera called Angels, and I played a bloomy ambulance called Terry, and I had a rather large girlfriend called Alison, and I ate a lot of cheese on toast, um, and wore a silly hat. It's impossible to look good in an ambulance hat, I'm here to tell you. Um, but anyway, um, the guy who was playing the lead in it, Al Ashton, became seriously ill. And um, the producer, who was a called Julia Smith, um, who went on to produce EastEnders, with the same scriptwriter, Tony Holland, as, as did Angels, um, they wrote me in as the lead. Um, and I didn't really want to. <laughs> play the lead in a soap opera um, at that time. Um, so, I mean, I did the obvious thing. I rang my agent and said, what else am I up for? Am I up for anything? My agent's name was Jan. And she said, well, you're up for a part on Doctor Who. But she said, they're not really seeing people for another six weeks or so. So I did a sensible thing. I, um, I had a BBC pass because I was in a BBC soap opera and I found out where the offices of Doctor Who were and I went and knocked on the door. And I said, hello, you don't know me. Um, the secretary answered the door. I said, but um, my name's Mark Strickson and I'm up for a part in Doctor Who, I know. Um, but I'm currently in Angels and they've offered me the lead in Angels and I just want to check there's nothing else on the table that I might prefer. Because all in all, I'd rather do Doctor Who. And um, John Nathan Turner came through from his office, and I went in, and I read, and I read, then he got Eric Say with it, and I read for Eric. And um, I can tell the story because John's now dead, and I won't get him into trouble. Um, but he said to me, he said, you've got the part, Mark. We think you'd be absolutely perfect for it, but we will be seeing people in another six weeks. Because the BBC, being a public broadcaster, has to do things the right way. Um, and it can't just advertise a job and see one person. Um, and, um, yeah, I got, I, I, he, he said, you've got the job, you can't tell anybody for six weeks, you can tell your agent, that's the only person in the world you're allowed to tell. And so I did, that was the only person I told. But I didn't take the part on the angels. But, there is another reason, other than being fantastically talented, but there is another reason why I got the job. John Nathan Turner had a long-running battle with Julia Smith, the producer of Angels. So he thought it was a wonderful way of getting back at her to employ me. So there you go. It's all it's a weird small world. And of course you missed out on going to Angels Con this weekend, wherever that might be. Did I, did I miss going to an Angels Con? Really? Oh wow. No, no, I suspect. Um, actually, um, uh, you, you may know, now I make, tend to make natural history programmes, I'm a documentary producer. But I got that job through Doctor Who. Which this is even weirder what a small world it is, right? So I, I went off to Australia, I did a zoology degree, I came back, sat in a flat in West Ham, and I wrote three films. And I sent them off to film companies around the UK. And I, one of the companies I sent them to was a company called Partridge Films in Bristol. And a chap called Andrew Buchanan rang up. And he said, hello, I'm Mark. He said, um, it's probably a stupid question, you aren't the same Mark Strickson who was in Doctor Who, are you? And I said, yes, yes. He said, well, I'm the same Andrew Buchanan, who was one of your production managers. And Andrew had completely retrained, joined the Natural History Unit, while I'd been doing a zoology degree, and we ended up in the same place. That was just peculiar. That's amazing, isn't it? Two paths lead back to the same thing. So, you mentioned um, reading through for Turlow and getting the part. How much of um, Turlow's backstory was, was ready-made, or was he just kind of back of a fight packing stuff? Well, it was sort of like back of a fag packing stuff, because 
Um, if you read Turner and the Earthling Dilemma by Tony Hatwood, which is a novel that's out there, there's a description of Turner. And that is a description of exactly what I was wearing when I met the author, Tony Atwood. Um, if you're going to be a regular character in anything, it really helps if you are in personality and character, something that fits. You don't have, don't have to do too much acting, right? Now, I'm not saying I like going around trying to kill people, but I have a certain sort of... I did play quite a lot of nasty characters on television. I have a certain evilness about me. <laughs> Um, and it was very useful as Turbo, and I think that's what John and Eric spotted. Um, and the first scene, this is, this is, this will frighten you. It certainly frightened me. When we were doing Doctor Who, how it was filmed was, you filmed on film, and did the location filming first, you then went into rehearsal, did two weeks rehearsal, did a studio, did two weeks rehearsal, did a studio, and that was four parts done. But there was no rehearsal at all before the filming. So I turned up at that school to drive that car in Bren Park in North London, right? Having had no rehearsal, no conversations around the character, I'd been sent to script. But what I did in that first scene, I knew I would be stuck with as Turner for as long as that character was in it. So that was a, there was a lot of, a lot of pressure there. And I did the first scene, and John Nathan Turner called me over and he said, and he said, Mark, oh, Mark, just a quiet word. And I thought, oh my goodness, have I been so bad, you know. And he, and he pulled me to one side, very diplomatically, he said, Mark, he said, can you be any posher? And I said, John, John came from Birmingham, and I actually come from near Birmingham. And, and, and I said, well, John, no, well, that, that's as posh as I get. And he said, that's all right, then that's Turner. You play it as you want to. And that is a real credit to John Nathan Turner, that he understood that I needed to be comfortable as an actor to be in that part for so long. Yeah, exactly, because you wouldn't want to be stuck doing something on the spur of the moment that you, like you say, you have to carry on forever then. So, um, in that those first few scenes, like you say, you're there with uh, your school, one assumes it's Turlow's school friend. Is it Stephen Garlick? Yes. My hippo. Hippo, yes. So what, what, how did you see the relationship between Turlow and Hippo then? Well, it was great because Stephen Garlick just made me laugh all the time. And so and I, I, I don't, I, I'm not an actor who corpses, but Stephen just has to look at me and I laugh. Um, and it's in my favourite line, which I had great difficulty getting out of. All, all my time in Doctor Who, my favourite line is in the first episode, where we run up the hill and, and Stephen goes, what's that? And I go, Transmit Don't you know anything? And I loved that line, and it took about ten takes because I was laughing so much. <laughs> Why would they call it a transmit capsule? <laughs> so of course, as well as as well as Hippo, you were um, almost immediately put in with the Black Guardian, yes. who gives Turlo his uh, his reasons for for wanting to leave. Well, he gives him a chance, an opportunity to leave the planet. So how did that work? Uh, acting opposite. Uh, Valentine Dow, because sometimes well, it was there, sometimes it wasn't. Acting opposite Valentine was fine, but acting opposite somebody who's got a bird on their head is slightly more difficult. <laughs> and what was that about? I sort of got it, but it is weird about <laughs> it. And then the white guy who's got a bloody white bird on his head. You just have to get used to being in Doctor Who, right? And you have to get used to the complete illogicality of it, right? Because it... It is the most difficult program to be really bad in, uh, to, to be really good in. It's a very, it's very easy to be very bad in science fiction. Um, and it's very difficult to be very good in science fiction. And, and, and the reason for that is, when I'd come from doing a soap opera, if I'm doing a scene with somebody, right, and, you know, it's about, I don't know, but it's about something normal, then you can feed back off the emotion of that person, and you tend to do quite long scenes. In science fiction, we tend to do quite small scenes, and it's not about anything to do with reality. So, you know, if you're on the floor being sucked out into space, and you, all you've got is a chalk um, circle drawn on the floor, and you have to scream tractators, 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 and foam at the mouth and be sucked out into space, if you don't really believe you are on a spaceship being sucked out into space, you will be rubbish. 
you have to believe that is the truth for that moment. And if, if a monster's chasing you, you have to believe that that monster can kill you. Because otherwise it's not real. You, you, it's not some sort of pantomime. It, 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 you have to feel the emotion. And that's very difficult when you're dealing with fantasy. Is it, is it right that you had to have your hair dyed? Yes, I, oh, yes, I did have to have my hair dyed. Sure. Um, yeah, no, um, no, to, okay, Peter and I, strangely, we were, Peter was only five years older than me, so I was 24, he was 29 when I started in Doctor Who. Um, and they wanted me to obviously look like a, a schoolboy. Um, but I always do remind people that I was an alien pretending to be a schoolboy. I wasn't supposed to be school age, it was supposed to look a little strange, right? Um, so John suggested, because I, Peter and I actually looked quite similar in, in terms of how I had my hair cut, and it was blondish, and in long shot, we, you could mistake one for the other. Um, so they wanted me to look completely different. Um, so John suggested I had all my hair cut off. I wasn't prepared to have all my hair cut off. I don't know why, sorry. <laughs> so they, they said, okay, we'll dye it red, right? And so they did. They, 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 they said, don't worry, it'll wash out, Mark. It didn't wash out, of course it didn't, right? So I had this copper metallic hair for two years. And I was instantly recognisable, and children, when I was first in Doctor Who, would run away from me in the supermarket because I was trying to kill the Doctor. <laughs> they were petrified of me. Not, not um, because you were ginger. <laughs> I'm sure tell you what an embarrassing ginger story. Um, I was in a, I was in a, I was in China. I know how ginger had people in China. I went to a public swimming pool, um, and there were about 400 people in the changing room. This being China, and as I took my clothes off, gradually a silence settled over the entire changing room. Then when I took the last bit of my clothes off, <laughs> they found out I was ginger. Um, they fell about with laughter. <laughs> Apparently it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. So I thought there's a new career for me here, comedy stripper in China. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Oh, so Tegan uh, seems to be paired up over the course of the, is the first three stories with Tegan more than anybody else. So how did you view their relationship between Tegan and Turlo? Ah, now this is very interesting. Right. Um, the Doctor can't have a relationship with an assistant, right? There can't be any romance in there. That's not allowed in Doctor Who. But it doesn't mean that assistants can't, or, or people travelling in the TARDIS can't. And I know that, you know, we were going out at 7.30 at night in those days, on a weekday night. I know that Eric and John, John in particular, wanted there to be a sort of romantic frisson between Turlo and possibly Nizza or possibly Tegan. And that sort of did work um, once Turlo had stopped trying to kill the Doctor. Um, so so there, was that, there was that element in there, um, which I thought made it a little more interesting, actually. Yeah, it's notable that you do get paired off together in, in certain stories, so and spent a lot of time crawling around a, an air duct or whatever it might have been under the, under the uh, floors of uh, yes. Tennis. Yes. I wore out the knees in a suit doing those scenes. I can believe that. So, um, yeah, so at what stage do you see Turnlaw start to struggle with his decision with the Black Guardian? How do you think he... he, he it's obviously a quite quick development over the three stories where he goes from wanting to get passage off Earth to by killing the Doctor to realise he can't do it and fighting back. I think, I think it was believable. Um, I mean, you couldn't have kept that plot running any longer because it would have relied on the Doctor and Turner both being terminally stupid. Um, you, you can't have somebody in the TARDIS try to kill you and not notice it. But you can for a while, but not for too long. It's just, it's just not going to work. Um, but the problem for Turner was, once he stopped killing the Doctor and stopped trying to get home, why was he there? That was a real issue. And it, and it didn't really work. That was why I, I mean, I think a lot of the stories were, were very strongly written, and I think Eric, the script editor, did a very good job. But I wanted, I resigned because I wanted Eric to give me a good, strong write-out, and I knew Peter was going. But I think Turner did his dash. Um, it was very difficult to not use Turner as a lead character. It didn't work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And he wasn't there just to say, what's that, Doctor? So I used to do a very naughty thing. I used to... 
I used to alter the lines. So the assistants are there to say, what's that, Doctor? Where are we, Doctor? Right? Well, I made every line I did as Turbo who had to do those lines. I didn't deliver them like that. I delivered them that, so you thought Turbo knew the answer. So, what's that, Doctor? Where are we, Doctor? So I know where I am. I know what it is. I'm just asking the doctor because I'm sort of bringing him into it. But I've already identified the problem. And, and that's the, I never, I never did the normal assistant delivery. Well, I mean, I suppose that fed back into where Turbo came from yeah. with his alien origins and you know, as it was put in. Uh, so all the, the Trion stuff and, and where he came from, that was all put in at the end. Yeah, that was all made. That was all made up at the end. <laughs> that wasn't. That wasn't in the plot at all at the beginning. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, uh, uh, Terminus, you seem to just be on a separate story strand to the rest of them. Obviously, it was Nissa's swan song, yeah. and it was more about her. Uh, but then, in Enlightenment, you come back to the fore as it kind of wraps up that trilogy about Turbo. Uh, and there were some really strong performances in there. Certainly, when when you as Turbo are, are trying to make the other deal with the pirate captain. Yeah. No, no, I, I quite enjoyed Enlightenment. I still have no idea what it was about. <laughs> and, and I'm not the only one. <laughs> that's, that, that's an occurrence of recurring theme for the battles of the Well, and, 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 it, 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 okay, so there's these ships going through space. And we did a Blu-ray of it. They, re, they digitally remastered the effects and they looked absolutely fantastic when they'd done it. Although I should say that the effects for one episode of the remastered version cost more than the entire four episodes of Cost to Make originally. <laughs> so that points, you know, that, that puts it a little bit in perspective. Um, my mum watched the new, I'll, I'll get back to it in my mum watched some of the new Doctor Who's, this is about 13 or 14 years ago, and I came, I was living in Australia at the time, and I came to see my mum and dad, and mum said, have you seen any of the new Doctor Who's? And I hadn't, I said, no, no, I haven't mum. She said, oh, they're much better than when you were in it. <laughs> By that she meant the effect, they'd spent some money on it. I mean, we were making Doctor Who off the smell of a oily rag. And Enlightenment was one of those stories. But we, we did this Blu-ray and they digitally remastered it. And um, Barbara Clegg was the writer. And she came to do, to do this with Peter and I. And I think it was Fiona Cummings, the director, as well. So you sit there and you watch the episode, right? For those of you who don't know how it's done. And, and you, you talk as you watch the episode. Um, and so Peter said, um, so Barbara, what was Enlightenment about? <laughs> she said, well, it was about boats going through space trying to find enlightenment. I said, yeah, but what's enlightenment? Well, boats going through space. <laughs> so I didn't actually think even the scriptwriter had fully worked out what it was about. But it looked wonderful, I thought. I mean, Janet looked beautiful in it. Um, we had a wonderful time making it. Um, I do think that Doctor Who works best when it's set in the past. I love the history um, stories in Doctor Who. I don't think it's as successful when we go into the future with Doctor Who, um, or even the present. Um, the main thing I remember it for was um, very badly injuring myself. Um, in, in the story, I throw myself off a ship into space. That was filmed at Ealing Studios. And I had a wire attached to me, just like Peter Pan does, you know, when Peter Pan flies into the theatre. It's got a Kirby wire, and you're attached to it. So I threw myself off the ship with the Kirby wire. Um, and Kirby are a company, they, they fit it to you, and it's their insurance and all those sorts of things. Um, so it's got nothing to do with the actor or anybody else. And so I threw myself off in confidence that I would just swing out into space, and the wire broke. Um, half of the harness broke and it was like jumping on a brick wall from about 20 foot up with your legs apart and if you look at those episodes i couldn't walk for about nine or ten days after so the next studio you'll see there are scenes in the tardis where turlo does not move that's because turlo can't walk properly and now these days actors would sue but in those days you just thought oh well and I'd foolishly sign the contract saying I'd do my own stunts. <laughs> that taught me a lesson. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. I've done that. So, um, you got to work with some fantastic guest artists. Can you recall any, any of those over the course of those episodes? Oh, yeah, I mean, th th one of the joys of working in Doctor Who was the guest artists. I mean, all these icons of British television. In, in that one, you had um, um, 
Linda Barron. Linda Barron. Linda Barron who plays Nurse Alice Emmanuel in Open All Hours, right, and those sorts of things. But she's, she's a terribly famous actress. Nurse Gladys Emmanuel, isn't it? Yeah. And um, it's just wonderful to work with her. And we have Keith Barron in that, in that same episode. Um, uh, then you worked with classical actors like Polly James. Um, I'm talking about Polly James also, you know, you hear Lightly Lads chat, you know. Um, what's his name? Come on, help me. Um, Rob, Rodney Hughes, Rodney yeah, Hughes. Hughes. Yeah, and then you'd, you'd end up, you know, with somebody from the Anedian line or, you know. It was absolutely fantastic. But that was one of the joys of working at the BBC at the time, because everything was in this rehearsal room in North Acton. And I always thought that the reason why the BBC had their rehearsal rooms in North Acton was to stop actors going to the pub, because it was basically on a traffic island surrounded by dual carriageways. There was no shop, there was no pub, there was no post office, there was nothing. But you'd walk into the BBC canteen and then the, the beat, you know, Paul McCartney or somebody sitting there, or, you know, the amazing huge stars, Elton John, you know, be sitting having beans on toast, you know, or something. And I remember um, Ronnie Barker, and the, the, the canteen was really full, and I, you felt terrible about going up and sitting next to famous people. And so I went up and I said, excuse me, Mr. Barker, would you, would you mind if I sat down? And he said, oh no, do please, young man, do sit down. Sometimes I think I smell. <laughs> but it was just, we were very aware that it was, that my first mortgage, um, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, uh, what's, what's his name? Place, Place Pike in Dad's Army. In, Lavender. Yeah, in Lavender, yeah. Anyway, he was, they, they, he, was re, he was rehearsing there, right? And I think Phil Danny was an actor, and another actor was there. And anyway, he, he, he walked past me, he said, Gotta see you at lunchtime, gotta see you at lunchtime, Mum, having a meeting, right? And we were all at a similar age, right? And he insists us down, it's about four or five of us young men, they says, There's a man at the Leicester Boarding Society in Hoban giving actors mortgages. Get down there! <laughs> and so it was this wonderful community where. If you really felt you were part of a little community working for the BBC, it was lovely. And of course, in Tillow's first story, you had to say the school, the, uh, the teacher character was played by Nicholas Courtney. Yes, he was. So. Nick, Nick, great. I mean, wonderful to work with the Brigadier. I couldn't have had a better start, really, could I? I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was great. Yeah. And how, how, how was that with him coming back into the role after a few years? Did he just pick it straight back up again? Or? Me, me, me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, now I can pick up Tillow tomorrow. Um, it, because there's a lot of me in it, I think. But the only thing I have to do is I have to talk a bit higher, because I'm now an old man and I talk like that. Um, so I, I do have to make an effort to get sort of up and youthful. Um, but particularly with Peter and Janet and Sarah, we just slot into it for the big finish things. And I did one of them in New Zealand. So I recorded the lines in New Zealand and they were laid into the finished product in, in, in the UK. And I hired some actors in New Zealand to play Peter and Janet and whatever. It didn't work at all. Um, it completely put me off. So what I did was at lunchtime I said, look, this isn't working. And then it's, it's a very weird recording. It must have been very weird for the guys who got it in London. Because what I'm doing is in my head, I'm being Peter, doing the delivery like Janet, and then I come out with my line. So there are these massive pauses in the scenes where I'm doing all their lines in my head, the so way they would. You're almost reacting to yourself, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, but I wasn't, I, I could see Peter doing it, I could see Janet doing it, and that was much more helpful than doing it with other actors. So, I mean, Tolo's initial trilogy, um, the character was probably well served in, the, in that arc. How, how do you think um, it fared afterwards? Oh, I mean, five doctors and things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, he turned up, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he thought it was all right, it was all right. I mean, this isn't a mean thing to say. Um, acting, what, the first thing an actor does when they get a script is they open it and they see how many lines they've got. And that isn't because they're up themselves and want a big part or anything like that. It's that if you've got a lot of lines, it's very much easier to be good than if you've only got a few lines. If you've got a few lines, you're kept hanging around, you suddenly have to do a scene which maybe you've only got one or two lines in. That is very difficult to act like that. If you're on the studio floor doing a scene, every second scene, it's easy. Oh, it's a lot easier. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
turn out, you know, when he, when he only had a few lines, it wasn't the easiest thing, easiest thing in the book. But he always came across as a strong character. Um, there's a nice story about that. In Five Doctors, um, there's a scene, it starts where I'm, we're at the top of a hill in Wales, and I'm drawing, doing a sketch, right? And we have a little, we have a little scene on the top of this hill. Now, it was all shot on film in those days. Now, when you finish shooting on film, in order to expose the film in a film camera, it goes through what's called a gate, and that's where it's exposed to the light, okay? Now, if the gate's got any dust or hair on it, it, it that, that is on the finished film, and you have to clean the gate and do it again. So you finish the scene, and the production manager goes, check the gate, and the cameraman checks the gate, and if the gate's clean, on you go and do, you do another scene. Well, they did this, but they got the film back to London, and there had been a hair right across the film. And these days, you could repair that in post-production, but you couldn't do that in those days. So they had to film it again. However, I had gone off in my VW Beetle with my wife, Julie, um, and we'd gone on holiday. And shock horror to all the young people here, there were no such things as mobile phones in those days. So I was uncontactable. So all the rest of the cast had, were taken back to Wales and they couldn't get me. So they did adverts on local radio and things like that, right? To try and find me. Well, we were just knocking around some cheap bed and breakfast in Wales, you know. And we did in the radio, didn't work in the car. And we were going to get it. That was good. So I got down to Stratford Avon where my great aunt Violet lived about five days later. And great aunt Violet asked, so I said, Mark, Mark, the BBC are trying to get you. There was a, a, a hair on the gate. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> yeah. And I had to go back to Wales and I had to do it all again. <laughs> right, well, has anyone got any questions they'd like to uh, ask Mark? Oh, there's some hands going up there, so I'll go and, uh, I'll go and dive off into the audience, leave you on the stage. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love that big TARDIS. I just love it. Great, isn't it? It's that? really great. I mean, it's hard to be jealous if we ever gets that. Right. Hello, there's Mark. Um, it's an observation as well as a question, if you don't mind. But in, the, um, in, in your time in the series, I always felt that you were absolutely brilliant at being terrified. You've mentioned earlier about the having to have a you know, sort of conviction that the thing that you're being terrified of is there. But one that stands out for me is just beyond uh, the trilogy, it's in front of us, and you mentioned the tractators, and when you mentioned tractators in that, I was terrified then, because you were so fr you looked absolutely terrified. And I'm thinking, what do you draw upon in order to give such a convincing performance of terror like that? Because there must be something horrible. Okay, well, this is where I have to admit I'm a deeply flawed person. Um, my mother has very bad dreams. And I have very bad dreams. I wake up whimpering in the night. People are always attacking me in my dreams. Um, and I, I must have a pathological fear of violence, which considering I've worked in war zones and been shot at, um, God knows how I've ended up doing that. But, um, yeah, no, I, I get... I go back into my world of my dream.